Okay, let's talk about managing uh, the row mite. And I have an entire PowerPoint on concepts of that, but I'm gonna just give you a couple of slides right now. Okay, the first thing is about managing the mite. It's not the varroa mite that normally kills the colony. It's normally the viruses associated with it. And if you look right here, uh, on this scale, the mites per 100 bees, you look at the red plot for the mites going from 0 to 100 up to uh, like 2200. And then the uh, blue plot and the green plot are the virus prevalence of the bees in the hive. And as you notice, if you stay up around this level below two mites uh, per 100 bees, so in a, a mite wash or a sugar shake of a half cup of bees, that would be below six mites uh, showing up. The virus levels remain very, very low. When the mite prevalence in the hive, the infestation rate, starts to increase, the viruses start to take off, and up around this level, they start to go epidemic. So when you have a, a sugar shake or a mite wash, you start getting around 15 mites in there, which would be this level, colony performance starts to drop off. When you get up to around 40 mites in a, in a half cup of bees, at that point the viruses go epidemic and the colony will typically die pretty soon from the virus epidemic. So when you're doing varroa management, you're doing vector management. It's like trying to reduce the number of mosquitoes in order to control uh, varroa. And I just can't tell you often enough, if you don't monitor your mite levels, you're gonna be surprised because sometimes they can increase uh, quicker than you might think they, they would. What we've gone now is instead of doing a powdered sugar shake or alcohol wash, uh, we find that Dawn detergent, this, it's a high foaming detergent common in the US. So look for a very high foaming detergent. A low foaming detergent does not do the job. It's something about this, uh, the surface tension, uh, the surfactant ability. Um, and the second thing is, with a release agent like alcohol or detergent, there's no reason to ever shake up and down. I come from the gold country where we pan gold in California. You would never shake the gravel and the gold up and down because that keeps the gold stirred up all the time. You want to precipitate the mites down so you do a swirling action and the mites drop very, very quickly. So even though many of the books say shake up and down, that is counter, physically counterproductive to precipitating the mites down. Okay, for any kind of pest, whether it's a pest of plants or of livestock, you have an integrated pest management pyramid. And the first thing at the bottom, you start with uh, resistant stock. So for example, I bought a place 20 some years ago. I planted about 15 different types of table grapes. And what I found over the years, uh, some of them have mildew issues every single year, and other ones growing side by side have no problems. Well, I can fight the mildew issues and, and spray fungicides or, or something every year, or just cut those out and grow ones that are naturally resistant. So that's what I do in my orchard, I do that in my garden, and I'm working on doing that with my, uh, my honeybees also. So what I'm doing is our commercial uh, queen producers, I realized in the United States, we're not gonna ever shift to resistant mites until the commercial queen producers who supply most of the queens are breeding resistant stock and making them available. There isn't a reliable resistant stock available in the, in the US at any amount right now. So the queen producer said, oh, it's gonna to be too hard, it's gonna to be, this. they have a million excuses not to do it. So I'm, I'm a member of the California Queen Breeders Association, so I know all the major queen producers. I said, tell you what, guys, let me do a demonstration project, an experiment, and see what would happen if I just put strong selective pressure, traditional breeding, no fancy science involved in any way, and just select for the most resistant queens uh, you know, the, who are also good performers every year, year after year, how much it would cost, how much time was involved. I'm intentionally avoiding instrumental insemination, single drone insemination, marker assisted selection, brood dissection, freeze killed hygiene tests, it, uh, uh, pro, uh, tracking of, of bloodlines to any extent, all the things that no queen producer wants to do. I'm avoiding all those. I'm doing one single thing mite washes. And that's the only thing we use for selective pressure. I'm not telling the bees how to do the job, which you do if you select for a certain trait. I'm saying the job description is keep your mite levels low. If you do that, <laughs> your, your genes go to the next generation. If you don't do that, your genes are out of the next generation. So we apply about a 98% elimination process every year. We only breed from about 2% of our queens every year. The other 98%, we don't, we don't select from. So what we do is every spring we come back from almond pollination and we split all of our hives 
typically about four ways. They come back very strong, about 20 frames covered with bees, and, and, and half of them with brood. And we split them four ways, and uh, we make about 3,000 uh, nukes every spring. We sell, some, sell about 1,000 of them, and uh, we, then we requeen all the rest with fresh uh, queen cells that we raised uh, that year. Now, by starting them with queen cells, you create an induced brood break. So that means that day 18, after making the split, you go back and you give them an oxalic acid dribble. It takes you just about five seconds to do that. And you start with relatively clean colonies every year. When it comes time for the honey flow, you can combine those splits back if they, and to make strong colonies if necessary. But this revolutionized our burrow management, starting out everything clean every year by making the splits. So out of those 3,000, we keep about 1,500 for ourselves, and we spread them out over about 60 apiaries in, uh, in our uh, location. And they each have a queen, a new queen grafted from a, a new mother from a mite-resistant colony the previous year. And then we begin the Varroa race. You cannot do selective breeding unless you can select between a variation of whatever trait you're looking for. So what we're looking for is enough variation in the mite levels in the hive. So we need to let the mites then from their starting point of, of a very low level, build up until we start getting up to seeing mite washes of, of 10 to 15 um, in, in the hives. You can't select the resistant ones. You need to let it build up a bit. So that typically takes us until the end of June, sometimes clear to the end of July until our mite levels get high enough that we can start to select those colonies that, that, whose mites have not gone up, that remain zero or one counts, to those that may have counts of, of 10 to 20. Okay, we, we label the ones then that still are zero and one counts, mostly zeros, as potential breeders and put a tag on the top of them. All the rest, we go ahead and treat. We use organic treatments, give them a, a, a treatment, um, and then nobody gets moved, nobody gets lost, no colonies die. We're not worried about allowing colonies to die. We just want to keep track of the genetics, shift the genetics, so no bees have to suffer uh, for this. We've come up with a very efficient system. We use a, um, and this is something that none of you guys are going to be able to do. It takes a lot of colonies. But we have mechanical agitators, battery-powered agitators. So for our mite washes, they do all the timing and the agitation. We just put the cup on, push a button, and it pops it out. So we can, we can put them out at a rate of, of one, four man minutes per wash. So that means if we have a, a crew of four of us in the field, we can do mite washes at the rate of one per minute. So if we go out to a, a, an apiary with 50 hives, in less than an hour, we're in and out and gone. So very rapid uh, uh, mite monitoring that way. Now what we do is we come back every month, and the ones that were tagged as potential breeders, we wash them again. The rest are just treated normally, if necessary, and left on their own. And if the mite count of a potential breeder goes up, you pull the tag off, give them a treatment, and, and move on there. In the first few years, um, the second wash, we eliminated a lot of the potential breeders, and by the third, we eliminated a lot more. It's getting a lot better uh, now, year after year. If those of you who have seen my Varroa model, this indicates your total uh, population of bees in the hive. This is your amount of sealed brood, your pupae. The red down here would be your percentage of pupae infested by a mite. Once you pass about the 30 percent uh, uh, infestation rate of the pupae, the virus is epidemic and the colony is walking dead. It's going to die. And then this would be your varroa population here, which climbs at an exponential curve. And then this would be your mite wash count for a half cup of bees. So in typical progression, when we started this, would be going from a zero count here, by September we're up to a 50 or 50 count and it, without treatment, and the colony would die. With our breeder program, we want these counts to, to stay in the SA potential breeder. You've got to be down zero to one all the way here. We'll let you come up a little bit in November when they, uh, they shut down brood rearing and the mites come out of the brood. You get a little spike. But then to be a, a breeder, that colony has to bring down the mites by itself over winter and be back to a zero or one count by the next uh, spring. And what you see here, so the July count one, August count one, September count, when they're shutting down brood rearing up to two. November, when they've shut down brood rearing, now we're up to a mite wash count of seven, but the colony brings it all by merch. 
they brought it back down to a low uh, count again. This is something that we learned to allow for the count in November uh, to go up. This is what we're looking for, colonies that just maintain zero counts for the entire season. Some of them will do it for two years in a row. In fact, we have a bunch of colonies now that, we've, that are second years and still maintaining zero counts, right in the middle of all the rest of the hives, all with plenty of mites immigrating in and everything. They're just mite-proof on their own. Now, people say, well, once you wind up with spicy bees or bees that are non-productive, well, this is me in August. Typically, it's hot out there and I may be taking 50 to 100 mite wash counts in an afternoon, and this is how I dress. I would know if they were not gentle bees, okay? We have a zero, po to zero tolerance policy for any kind of spicy bees whatsoever, okay? We, keep, we like to work in just shorts and t-shirts, um, or less, uh, all during the summer. We, we, we don't normally wear any uh, protective gear. Sometimes my sons will put a veil on. If, if I put a veil on in my operation, the word goes around, the whole neighborhood's alerted. Everybody goes, oh, Dad's putting a veil on. Everybody go, go, go get some gear, okay? So we breed for, for gentle bees. This is what we found out. I, I realized that um, this spring, I asked my sons, I said, boys, I need about 450 hives uh, for research uh, this year. So they, the deal was that when I gave them, handed over the operation, they could have the operation, but they had to allow me to take hives out for research at any time. I said, I need the first one, I'm going to need 250 hives for a trial of Midas of, uh, of oxalic acid. I'll show you the results later. So I said, when they come back, you make your splits from the bees coming back from almonds, don't eliminate any of the colonies that were marked as non-resistant. Put those queens back in the nukes, let them build up, and they, because I can't do a test for, pet, for miticide uh, efficacy on a resistant colony, because the mites are not going to come up. So I had to identify colonies in which the mites actually would build up. So we said, OK, great. So we, they set up a few big holding yards, of a bunch of hives. And we went out there in June. And the bad news was, uh, Dad, uh, there's not enough mites building up. <laughs> and then we went to July. Oh, Dad, well, we're going to have problems finding <laughs> out of the 450 or so hives enough hives that the mites build up. Our joke was, we don't have enough mites. We can't find colonies in which the mites have built up. And I realized what we've been doing in June and July, when we exclude any, pro, any colony that had a, a count of above, above one, many of those, if we hadn't treated them, would have brought the mites down by themselves. They actually were resistant colonies. It, we just didn't, couldn't, didn't, we misidentified them. So this is what's interesting. When I look at these yards then, this was in uh, uh, mid-July. This is the histogram of my count. So the 93 hives, these columns add up to 93. This, and here's your mite wash counts, 0 to 5, 6 to 10, clear up to 56 to 60. Now this shows you the potential of, on a non-resistant colony. Non-resistant colony could have easily had a mite count of 50. The average across the yard was 16. So I used the Poisson distribution to show what the expected frequency would be of mite wash counts. And you see, it would peak at the 16 count. And because you, uh, you can't go less than zero, it's, it's loaded to one side. But this, this is what we would expect if the, on a random distribution if the mite, average mite count was 16. You can see what we actually saw was a very skewed distribution. What we saw was here, over 25% of the colonies were exhibiting very strong resistance. So this would be a year and a half um, without treatment on these, even though they were, of course, they were nuked down that, that had an effect, but not much buildup. 135 hives at this, this was a holding yard, so very intense mite pressure. <laughs> there were over 30% showing resistance. And what I realized is that resistance is not black or white. It's not like you're just zero or 60. There's a gradation. So these colonies here were also pretty resistant. You know, not, so they may have required one treatment a year rather than zero treatments. The other thing, misconception people have, they talk about resistant queens. There's no such thing as a resistant queen. 
Mites don't bother the queens. The queens have nothing to do directly with mite resistance. All they do is they just pass the genes on to their daughters. The daughters are the ones, the workers, who have to e exhibit the traits for resistance. What I see in our operation, we're not telling them how to do the job. We're not doing any particular test. But we see a lot of uh, uncapping behavior and a lot of varroa sensitive hygiene. And that would be expected based upon uh, research done by uh, Stephen Martin and others throughout the world for Apis mellifera for resistance traits. <clears throat> and the proof of concept is the colonies look beautiful. Now, what's interesting, the first round of brood from those resistant queens is solid. There's no missing cells. By late summer, this would be typical, where you see a number of of, of holes. Well, that is them being resistant. That's the varroa sensitive hy hygiene. So this will have a mite count of zero if you do a wash, but they have mites. They just don't allow the mites to reproduce. And they're often the, the best honey producers in the yard. So they're gentle. Uh, if, if they're not a good honey producer or a strong colony, they're out of the program. We pull the tag off of them. If it's not a, a colony of bees that somebody would want to buy and use, they're out of, out of the program. So we have a lot of ones that are maybe small and resistant, but we're not interested in them. They get pulled out. So here's a tracking. I just made this up, starting from 2017, when we had Queen Zero, one colony out of 1,500. OK, that's a tiny fraction, less than 1%, that exhibited resistance. And so these are the a percent non-resistant. The green is the percent resistant. And you can see how it's been increasing going up and up like this. Now, so after seven years of breeding, we've increased by 500-fold the percentage of colonies that are exist, exhibiting strong resistance. Now, we just reached a tip point, possibly. Understand that the genes for the daughters come Come, for the workers, come from half from the queen and half from one of the drones, um, or for the colony, all the drones that she made it with. The genes, the alleles, the genetics of the drones come from the grandparents' po uh, uh, po population, not from their parents, it's from the grandparents. So you have a two-year lag in the of the genetics of the drone pool. So you have a one-year lag with the genetics of selecting the queens, but a two-year lag of the genetics for the drones that they mate with. So our drone pool for this year's, when we are, or for next year's, this spring when we start breeding, will come from the 22 drone pool, less than what, what's holding us back is the drone pool here, when we made it these queens, well, 98% of the drones came from non-resistant colonies. It looks like 2023, we've got roughly 50% resistance now, which means the drone pool two years from now will pass the halfway point. That may be a tip point. So now the majority of queens will be mating with drones from a resistant colony rather than a minority of the drones coming from resistant colonies. So cross your fingers for us, okay? We're making, making progress, which is heartening. So no one can predict the future, but I, I can see from here that uh, someday Varroa is going to be a minor problem. We, we have a you know, huge number percentage of our population that needs no treatment. Now, we do treat the, the colonies that need treatment. We use only uh, sustainable miticides. We, we haven't used a synthetic miticide in 22 years now. Okay? Now, there are a number of different options, so that's what I'm going to go over uh, uh, briefly on this. And again, I have... We, we used this, you know, almost 30 years ago. We've never used any of the Amitraz treatments in the operation. Virtually all the commercial bee hives in the United States are, are treated illegally with uh, smuggled Amitraz. That's the, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. But it's failing now. So the commercial beekeepers are asking me, okay, Randy, how do you do it? Okay, so uh, a, lot of in, a lot of questions about using what we have available. You apparently don't have HopGuard here, but you have uh, an oxalic, uh, oxalic, a uh, formic, and, a, um, and the ApiGuard uh, gel. So most countries, other than South Africa, skipped all the steps of the integrated pest management pyramid and went straight to the insectivity miticides. South Africa didn't. And six years later, they don't even talk about Varroa. If you go to a national conference and, or read a, uh, any of the literature from South Africa, Varroa is not even mentioned. It's of no concern to the beekeepers. They all, all their colonies have Varroa. 
But by just allowing nature to take its course, they, um, uh, the bees evolved resistance uh, to Varroa. Um, and that would have happened also for us, but most of all beekeepers would have gone out of business. Same thing in Cuba. So there are places where they, when people step out of the way and don't prolong the agony by, by treating, you have responsibility. If you're going to use a miticide to kill the mite, that gives you the responsibility to also engage in a selective breeding program so you don't have to keep using that miticide for the rest, well, it won't work for the rest of your life uh, because of resistance. The synthetic miticides, they only require a mutation in one gene in order to gain resistance. And the mites have shown they can do that very well. For fluvalinate, we got Varroa uh, right around here, uh, eight, 1987. Within six years, fluvalinate was not working. Uh, Kumafos was replaced it within three years. It didn't work. And Amitraz, which had been minor used early on, uh, all the beekeepers shifted over to uh, Amitraz, all but, but, <laughs> but me. I shifted over to Amitraz, because I thought resistance would happen quickly again, and I got off that bandwagon. But um, it didn't. It's, it's taken now until the last couple of years for Amitraz to show resistance. Data from uh, Dr. Frank Rinkovich shows that compared to the um, uh, non-resistant mites, such as what I have in, in my operation, um, some of the uh, mite bloodlines are up to 20 times more resistant. It takes 20 times a higher dose of Amitraz to kill them. So this is going to happen. Now, these guys have not outcompeted the non-resistant mites because there's a fitness cost to have resistance. And the same thing happened with fluvalinate. Fluvalinate would control the mites to some extent, <clears throat> but they could not outcompete the non-resistant mites unless you put the treatment in every year. So since they had a fitness cost, they were not as uh, successful at reproduction, the mites were actually easier to control because the resistant mites didn't build up as, as fast. This is happening also with the amitraz resistant. If these mites could reproduce as fast as the, um, the non-resistant mites, uh, they, we would have no amitraz susceptible mites uh, left. So there's a very high fitness cost. But all it's gonna take is one mutation to gain re full resistance without a fitness cost, and bam, they're going to outcompete everything else. So the biopesticides are much more uh, sustainable, and they're biodegradable. So they are the also called the organic treatments or the uh, natural treatments. Um, Timol, a formic acid, and oxalic acid, and these are the uh, three. With very occasional, we we'll use this one that we've used in our commercial operation for over uh, two decades. Now, when you do these treatments. You can use my Varroa models, free online, to plan your management strategy. So no treatment, you would have your mite wash count go up like this, and your colony would crash. Many beekeepers do what's called reactive uh, management. They wait until the mite counts get high, and then they react by bringing them down. The problem is the virus epidemic in the hive has already started, and it takes more than a month to, for the colony to, re to purge the viruses out after it gets the mites down. So the proactive beekeeper starts early in the spring, gets the mite count down very low, such as we do with our oxalic dribble and the induced brood break in, uh, in March and April. That allows your colony to maintain a very low mite level, but more importantly, a very low virus level through the season and makes mite control way, way, way easier because they don't go up as high during the summer. So then the proactive beekeeper would treat if necessary, early in the spring, again in August after you've uh, pulled your honey, and then maybe a, a oxalic acid dribble during winter. And what you see is the mite level is kept very, very low throughout the season. You have more productive and healthier colonies by doing this, and rural management is much easier for the beekeeper. What we do is we come back from almonds, split our colonies, do an oxalic acid dribble, do a formic or an extended release oxalic acid a treatment here. Uh, we, get, we have an exper I get an experimental use permit um, from the uh, California Department of Agriculture every year, so I can legally do that. But many beekeepers are you know, not following the law and they're doing it anyway. A uh, time all treatment here and oxalic dribble. We've used this rotation for 20 years and it works very well in our operation. So, I have a very different operation with as an almond pollinator, but you can use my model to plan it for your op operation. And the big learning thing that we learned is that doing those springtime splits 
really, really uh, helps us. Key thing, don't count on one treatment. You guys are all beekeepers, but most of you are likely varroa breeders because if you use the same treatment year after year, you are selectively breeding for mites that are resistant to that treatment. So try to avoid being a varroa breeder and focus on your bees. So rotate your treatments, hit the mites from, with a different mode of action throughout the year, and that helps you to avoid breeding resistant mites. I do on my first year beekeeping, I do have this here, you can uh, look at it. And this is what I found in my operation Timing-wise, at the colony, uh, relative to the environment and the, what the colony is doing at any time, whether the brood is diminishing, whether they're swarming, what would be the appropriate uh, treatment to use at that time to help you choose how to do your rotation management strategy. The problem that we have here in the U.S. and here is there's too few registered products. Once one product gets on the market, there's very little incentive because we're such a small market. It costs so much and takes so much time to go through the registration product uh, uh, process. There's little financial incentive for companies to bring new products to the market. So I'm involved right now with the, um, uh, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the United States suggesting that we follow New Zealand's model and New Zealand, who also is a first world country with beekeepers who are about roughly the same intelligence as beekeepers elsewhere. And New Zealand said, well, I'll tell you what, um, we know you're going to go ahead and use other things, so why make you all into outlaws? Go ahead, you're allowed to use the generic off-the-shelf oxalic acid, formic acid, and thymol, and figure out how to use it yourself. We're not, there's no risk to the environment. So, so uh, you can do it. I would suggest you put pressure on your agencies too to say, hey, we're adults, <laughs> you know, trust us, we're not going to poison anybody with these things, let us just use these. I did, I am in the process right now of challenging the EPA on the letter of the law. And uh, um, I wrote a letter to them in July, and then our, they didn't get a reply, so our national organizations um, uh, forwarded copies of my letters. And then when I was speaking to Ipamandia, um, I got a phone call, hey, can you get on a Zoom call with the administrator, the top person in the USDA, whose <laughs> my letter had come to his attention, and yesterday I got a phone call saying, uh, can you uh, meet back again with the administrator of the EPA on November 6th, because uh, they've had a team of lawyers working on response to my, my letter. So you can, if you look at the law carefully, approach your regulatory agencies and say, how about a little bit of common sense to help us beekeepers out? So, of the essential oils, so let's go through some of the uh, miticides you might use. So there's different uh, time oil treatments used throughout the world. Um, things I've learned with the time oil treatments, if some colonies will propolize them over, um, especially if there's an oil in the treatment, an oil, oil base, and uh, they cover them with propolis. Other ones will build a cup around the uh, treatment, and I just saw some, uh, some essential oils uh, blocks that I was testing. They're completely enclosed. You see a solid chamber of propolis, but if you break it open, it doesn't touch the block anywhere. They leave a quarter inch RB space completely around it, and then they build this shell around it, this hollow shell around uh, uh, that volatile. Now, all of the of the registered products for Tymol have roughly a 12 gram dose. You put more than 12 grams in, it'll blow the bees out and they'll shut down brood rearing, and you have to repeat the, the treatment again. When I've tried a 12 gram dose just on a, a piece of paper towel, um, that, on warm weather, that'll blow the bees right out of the hive, okay? You can only put about six grams in, so it's all about how quickly the dose is released, that the Tymol is allowed to evaporate. What I also did for the Apigar gel, I've noticed that that is not efficacious if the bees don't physically remove those particles of gel. If they leave them on the, on the card on top of the hive, it's not efficacious. So it's not just a vaporization action. You ha they ha had to move the gel. So I was curious. So I used fluorescent, green fluorescent tracer, put it in the Apigar gel, and then went back to see where that fluorescence would show up. It all shows up on the bottom board right through there. So what the bees do is they go up, they grab the gel, 
carry it down through the brood nest, and while they're carrying it down, that's where the vapors of the thymol then get exposed to the mites. Okay, with the paper towel, which is the grayish right here, same thing. As they chew it up, they pull it down below, and that exposes it to, to them. With the paper towel, by the way, when you put it in like this, if there's no oil in here, within two days, they've fanned on it enough that they've evaporated most of the time, well, then they very rapidly chew it up, and another day, it's out of the hive entirely. So they won't chew it until the time all vapors get a little bit less intense. So then we tried with, with uh, fiberboard, foamless uh, blocks, trying them with different amounts of time all and different amounts of oil, 16 different combinations. And we found out if they have oil in it, they get covered up with propolis. If there's no oil, just time all alone, they will get chewed out. So I thought, well, let's try this in a colony. Let's put some blocks in and a thicker block, a cellulose block, to slow the evaporation rate. Let's try putting 12 grams in. Well, we put in 12 grams, and there's less, much less adverse effects than there was with the Apigar gel. Now, I love Apigar gel. We've used it for many, many years. But there's less adverse effects with the same dose applied in the block. It apparently evaporates more slowly. So then we tried 24 grams, and that worked fine. I tried 48 grams, and that worked okay. Did very few adverse effects, so we went back to 36, and then I did a, did a dose response curve. This was a year before last. So we, at six grams per hive, this is the amount of ROA uh, reduction right here. So 100% reduction means you, you have zero mite count at, at the end. Um, you had so-so uh, mite control. 24 grams, pretty good. 48 grams, complete mite control. 36, pretty good. So it looked like the sweet spot would be about 40 grams of thymol applied to a hive. So this season, we made up blocks with 10 grams each. So four blocks would be 40 grams. We put them out in very, very hot weather. So um, outside temperatures, 30, 36 degrees or so. Um, under a brown lid with the sun beating on it. So it was very, you couldn't put your hands on the lid. It was, it was that, that hot. Four blocks into here. So 40 grams total treatment. And what the, the weaker colonies, many of them would uh, move the brood ring from the upper box down to the lower box and then backfill with nectar and honey uh, above, which actually helped prepare the colonies for winter, arrange their shorts. Because we, we, now we run a double deep. It would be different for, for you guys. And I'm not suggesting you guys do this. This is experimental stuff trying to develop a better way of application. Some colonies completely ignored it. <laughs> and they, they reared brood right next to the blocks and built comb. So there's a big colony colony uh, variation. What was interesting in the upper uh, brood chamber, the queens were not repelled by the fumes. They would come up and lay an egg in every cell. In quite a few of the colonies, there were eggs in every cell in the upper brood chamber, but you never saw young larvae. So the queens were not repelled, but the nurse bees said, uh-uh, we're not going to try to feed these larvae here, and they would apparently cannibalize them. But they would, in the lower brood chamber, there was unbroken brood rearing the entire period of time. So they continued, they did not set the colony back, even with that extremely high dose of time off, because it was released very slowly. At the end of 21 days, we went back to do final mite counts and do final brood assessment, and here's a frame of brood pulled out of the upper box in hot weather. And you can tell me how, how hard that was on the brood. That was very typical. By 21 days, um, uh, the colonies tolerated this very well. The mites did not tolerate it very well. So what this shows is the blue column, each, a, these are all pairs of columns. The blue column is your starting mite count, mite wash count. The red column is your ending mite count 21 days later. The, that if there's a lot of red, that's bad. That means it did not control. If there's a lot of blue, that's good. That means it did get good control. Notice we started with some colonies clear up to you know, pushing 80 mites, okay? colonies that are on the verge of death. And at the end, we had one mite in the mite wash count. But if you don't see a red column, what would that indicate? What was the mite count? Zero. That's a zero. So these results indicate that the treatment was very efficacious against Varroa. So I'm hoping a product of this will be brought to the market. There's other essential oils that have good selectivity ratios. So selectivity ratio means 
how, what's the difference between the dose that will kill mites versus the dose that will kill bees? If it's one to one, it doesn't help you. If it's the same dose, you're going to kill your bees along with the mites. So you want to find a selectivity ratio of five to one if possible. That means a, an, a margin of safety of, a f of five. So it takes five times as much to kill the bees as it does kill the mites. And there are a number of essential oils that have selectivity ratios above five. So we've been working on testing them all summer. I got some trials still going on. I'll tell you right now, nothing's knocked my socks off yet. As much as I would love to come up with essential oil treatment other than time all, we haven't found it yet. Um, but we're, we're going to continue next, next year. So that moves on to the organic acids. <clears throat> Again, you don't have the hops beta acids, which you guys should ask to get this registered because it is, is handy. Um, it's a natural treatment. And then formic and oxalic. So the hops beta acid, we get it in this. It's an extract of hops flowers. It tastes like Guinness Stout on steroids. Okay, very, very bitter. But it's non-toxic, biodegradable, and the colonies tolerate it well. They may move their brood away a bit, but they do not shut down brood wearing as they do with the thyme oil and the, and the formic. Um, one application works in the winter. It requires uh, two to three uh, if they have brood during the summer. Formic acid, bees have evolved with formic acid for many years because ants produce formic acid. So these are carbon ants in California which put out enough to make your eyes water and stop you from breathing. Very strong formic, uh, formic acid. It's the only... Uh, a treatment that will penetrate the cappings and we knock the, the brood out after treatment where we see what percentage of the mites are killed. You can actually, if you put a high enough dose on, it can kill the mites under the cappings. The problem is you're right on your selectivity ratio of what requires to kill the mites under the cappings is very close to what is required to kill the queen bee. So that's the hard thing with formic acid. <clears throat> So it does give colonies a fresh start. After you, you do a formic treatment, the brood pattern almost always comes back looking very, very nice. Now, worldwide, there's lots of different formic application methods. And each country has different restrictions on how you can do it. I'm testing out um, three of them right now. So this would be the formic flash that just overnight very quick. Um, and this would be uh, one of our older uh, products in the United States, which we liked a lot. And then I'm testing out some of these other evaporators. Now, I was curious about whether we could just pull the queen out when you put the, uh, you have a, a first day flash off with, with you have mitre with quick strips here, right? Uh, okay. But the problem with mitre with quick strips, they are actually less, the previous product by the same company, we liked a whole lot more. It didn't have a first day flash. The quick strips have a first day flash off where you, you have a, a very high, uh, amount of vapors released, and that's when you get queen kills. So I was curious, well, can you pull the queen out, put her in a cage, take her into the, into the house, and then wait for a couple of days until the flash off is over and the, and the bees have accepted the formic fumes and are walking over the pads and, and they're calm about them. Could you reintroduce the queen? So I did a trial this, this summer where I pulled the queens out with some workers in cages, put them in an incubator for two and a half days, and waited for the formic to dissipate somewhat, still uh, smells, but past that, and the, and the, the bees were all nonchalant, the workers were nonchalant walking over the pads. Took the queens back, put them on the landing board, let them walk in. Now, some queens go, uh uh, <laughs> that smells in there, I'm not going in. Okay, I got them all to walk in, and then I would check back. In a number of colonies, the bees jump on that queen, ball her, and try to kill her. Okay, their own queen being returned to the same colony. And I, the first one I saw do that, I go, wow, did I get the colony numbers wrong? And I said, no, I, I didn't get the colony. Everything was, was right. A number of colonies did it. Other ones, the bees would mob their mo queen and say, oh, mom, you're back. But they were not aggressive to her in any way. They just, a bunch, and so she was accepted back, back in. So found out that, yeah, sometimes it may just be the bees killing them. So then I wondered, well, who's actually killing the queen? Is it the formic or is it the bees killing them? Um, the queen is the largest and best nourished bee in the whole hive. Why would she be more susceptible to formic acid than the workers? So I did a trial. I made a bunch of push-in cage cages like this. And this off a mason jar rim works perfect for this. And you solder a piece of screen in there. You make a push-in cage. So I took the queens, marked them, put three attendants in, not enough to ball the queen, but enough I could t check for mortality of the, of the workers versus the queens pushed them in here, and then put them in single 
brood chamber hives and put a very strong formic treatment directly over them in hot weather. And when I came back, most of the queens were still alive. This is something my sons have found because in the summer, they often use um, a strong formic treatment to purge the mites from a colony. If we have a second year queen, because um, we do run some queens for a second year, and they, and they want to they want to kill the queen. So if they try to kill the queen in hot weather, the strong formic treatment, even of those old second year queens, we find about half of them survive. So formic works really, really good at killing queens if you don't want to kill the queen, but if you do want to kill the queen, it doesn't work very well, okay? We haven't figured out why that works. And so what I found out when I came back, most, even put right below the strong formic treatment, most of the caged queens survived just fine. Two of them did die, and the key thing was the attendants did not. So that's showing me that just the fumes alone can kill the queens, appears to be more susceptible. And I, that's a relatively small trial. We had like a dozen hives in that, so I'll, I'll ex expand on that. But it does indicate that um, the queens may be more susceptible to formic than the uh, workers. So this is, here's your mighty way quick strips. And so this is your first day uh, uh, grams of weight loss, uh, very, very high. Um, we want to be down in this range for a formic treatment. So what I do, I go out every day and I weigh whatever formic applicator I'm using and get a weight gain, a weight loss every day. And then from that, I can calculate how much formic acid is being released into the, uh, in the colony. So this is the problem. So what I did is, oops, I wondered, wow, what if you keep the wrapper you take off and just lay the wrapper over the top to slow the ra rate of evaporation? And let me go back here. And that avoids that flash the first day and actually extends the release for the rest of the days. We use it for treating nucleus colonies. We found that little five-frame nucs in hot weather, if we put the, a half of a white of quick strips on the top bars and then press the lid down so the top of the lid touches it, you can treat a five-frame nuc in very hot weather without losing any queens by just uh, covering the top of the pad. Anyway. Um, so we found out we get roughly the same efficacy against the mites, but we have zero queen loss by simply putting the wrapper. You don't wrap it up, you just lay the wrapper or any piece of plastic or anything on top of the, your formic. So you, you guys could try that. That would be legal to modify the treatment by just reducing that flash off the first day. Now, with both formic and oxalic, they are acids. Some acids you're very familiar with with vinegar and lemon juice, both acids. Both of them, if you get them in your eye, you're going to know you had an acid. I almost died inhaling a squirt of vinegar a few years ago. It hit my windpipe. And the vinegar, vine, all acids have some danger. Battery acids, sulfuric acid, more dangerous. The oxalic and formic are somewhere between the danger of those two. So you don't want to get oxalic or formic acid into your nose or your eyes. Don't take my word for it. You can try it. Um, um, <laughs> And it's very easy to get them on your hands. Formic acid on your hands, you won't feel any pain. But the next day, the skin will come off of your, your fingers. It, gets, it, it can be pretty ugly that way. Um, oxalic, we get it on our hands all the time. Um, and what we've learned, we just are always tasting our fingers. And if they taste like lemonade, you know you have some acid on your fingertips. You're not going to poison yourself with it. Don't worry about that. So we are always tasting our fingers. So we always carry a jug of baking soda, 10 heaping tablespoons per gallon. It has to be a very strong solution. That will instantly neutralize any acid on your fingers, on your hive tool, on your smoker. You'll see your fingers just bubbles coming off very, very quickly. But it'll, within seconds, it will neutralize any acid. So always, if you're using these organic acids, have a jug of strong baking soda solution labeled on hand for neutralizing everything. Now, in California, we all grow up sucking on this plant. This is the plant, Boxalis, that oxalic acid is named after. Okay, so de to deter predators from eating it, the plant produces oxalic acid. All Californians grow up sucking on, we call it sour grass when you're, when you're kids. It tastes like lemonade. It causes minor brain damage, which is why all Californians have, <laughs> uh, are the way we are. Okay? Um, you're very familiar with the dribble method. Typically, it's five millimeters per seam. I'm testing right now, following research by, from, by Tomema in, uh, in Estonia, that we may want to do a larger, uh, uh, more volume, not more dose, but more volume. 
I'm, I'm testing a bunch of different doses of oxalic. You, uh, you'll see why in just a minute. So we typically, we treat all our hives during the winter once they go broodless. So those hives we looked at yesterday that are broodless, they can all be given an oxalic acid dribble and that will eliminate most of your mice. Very efficacious then. Um, during the summer, no. Multiple oxalic dribbles during the summer don't work well. And I tested uh, oxalic in five milliliters uh, in 20 milliliter, the uh, same amount of oxalic acid, but in 20 milliliters instead of five to get better distribution. And with either uh, with glycerin instead of sugar, because we use glycerin in our dribble rather than sugar, so the bees are not tempted to eat it and pass it on to the brood. Um, and then uh, in plain water, and we had, see the amount of red? Almost no, that was four applications of dribble four days apart, and almost no mite control uh, with colonies with brood. So don't waste your time trying to dribble with during the summer. The other thing, though, I also measured colony strength at the beginning and the end. And notice the red bars were not higher than the blue bars, which means those colonies did not grow. But in the control group, which I did not treat, they all grew. So apparently there's an adverse effect of doing four dribbles during the summer. Now, many beekeepers um, in some of the Mediterranean countries are now doing an induced, uh, induced brood break by caging their queen by various methods, and then you can do a dribble during the summer. That does work well. One of the things that we use uh, is a, uh, division boards. Um, you can trap the queen between two excluder boards like this. We do this in our queen rearing all the time. To get queen larvae of the right age to graft, we move the breeder queen uh, twice a week into an, a single comb of dark comb so that four days later we can have 12-hour-old uh, larvae to graft. So we're very used to using this. But this can be used for a induced brood break. Just go to my website. It'll tell you the actual timing. Very, very simple. Most people leave the queen cage too long. Two weeks is all you need if there's not much drone brood in the hive. Um, do you guys use vaporization here? Okay, so this is very popular in some areas in the United States. I've had beekeepers from all over the world send me large data sets of mite drop counts post-vaporization. If there's brood in the colony and you're using the allowed one gram per brood chamber, it takes typically seven to 10 applications to get the mite level down. If you think you're gonna get mites down with one or two shots with vaporization, you're dre it dreaming. It's not that efficacious. Uh, research by Dr. Cameron Jack shows that to really get much efficacy if there's brood, you have to use three grams per brood chamber. We'll come back to that number in a, a few minutes. So at Argentina, um, a group of beekeepers came up with a great idea to extend the release rate of oxalic acid by dissolving it in glycerin and putting it on cardboard strips. And this does work very well, but it does it's time consuming for a commercial beekeeper such as myself. Inserting the required six to eight strips per hive for 1,500 hives takes a lot of labor. So we've been working on ways of using a horizontal application like this. Again, this is not yet approved in this country, but, you, but there are products, I'm sure, in the registration pro process of the, in every country of, uh, from Vita Europe and from IUN Cap, so that you will probably have this available for you um, within a few years here. At least you'll have one of these. I don't know about that one. Um, and there's apparently no adverse effect on the brood. And um, I get feedback from beekeepers around the world saying, oh, these are the best honey crops we've ever had. You know, and the brood looks beautiful after treatment. Um, so very good feedback on this method. And we've used it in our operation a lot. I'm still testing continually different matrices uh, to use and different ratios. So this summer, we ran a large trial, 200 plus colonies, testing 18 different combinations of, of five different matrices and four different formulations of putting it on. And I just worked up the data, but I'm not gonna, preliminary data. Again, look for less red, more blue. Now, we've been completely blind. What's happening in the hive with oxalic acid? And the question is, well, if you're putting it in with extended release, will you have a buildup of acidity in the hive? That's a legitimate question. And how big a dose actually shows up on the bees? So what I use is a titration method. I haven't published this yet, but I'm fine-tuned this now. You start with uh, a test tube with an indicator solution at that color. If you drop a bee in, if there's any 
acid on the bee's body, it turns it towards orange, and then you put drop by drop of titanium back in until it comes back to the original color. And it's very easy. If you overshoot, it gets too blue. So in 15 seconds, I can tell you how many micrograms, how many millionths of a gram of oxalic acid are on a bee. So we've done thousands of these. We found out oxalic acid on a, on a glass cover slip does not degrade at all over time. This is your hours up to 12 hours. These are days down here. If you mix it with any organic material, sugar or glycerin, or put it on a dead bee's body, whether on the bench or in the freezer, and that's all these right here, you get very rapid degradation. With your vaporization, you got two thirds within a day has degraded. So it does not build up in the hive. Now, the question is, if you dribble it, how even is the distribution on the bees' bodies? If I use a fluorescent tracer, I can see some bees get a big bunch in the dribble, some get little tiny bits. So it's very, very uneven distribution on the bees. If I titrate those bees, you can see some will get a dose of 100 micrograms, some will get a dose of close to zero. So how do the mice then get exposed to this? See what I'm doing? I'm unblinding us here. If you vaporize it, you get these crystals on the bee's body. So I, I, I can titrate how much acidity there is on there. So we did it with 15 hives, 15 different application methods uh, of vaporization, of dribble, of the sponges, of the New Zealand strips, of shop towels, and went out every day and from the same frame from each hive, took three samples of five bees and titrated them, um, one after the other, huge amount of data, and we can show that with the dribble, you get a very high spike of oxalic acid residue on your first day. By day three, it drops off quite a bit. On most of the extended release sponges, it comes up low and it peaks about day three or four and then drops down. Vaporization never gets that high. That's the three gram dose. That's three times the allowable dose. You know, with vaporization, you don't get that much dose. Um, and then we revaporized right here. I mean, we applied the New Zealand strips right there. We're now unblinded. I'm now going out in the hives almost every day and titrating bees. I can tell you what bees have oxalic acid on their bodies, which one. So now, instead of blindly coming up with application methods, we can do this actually looking. This is a vaporization. So this is a, a, a double deep at one gram per brood chamber. So two grams per hive. And these are... These, I got to scatter these, these are overlap. There's 10, 10 bees right here. And this is the yellow is summer treatments. This is the average for a winter treatment. We very rarely get over 20 micrograms per bee at that. If you do the three grams for brood chamber, the stronger treatment, we're up in that 30 range where you start getting some effic efficacy. So that's why we have the, le the legal treatment right now is too low. You don't get up enough to uh, do it. So how does it work at such low residue levels? So this very interesting study out of Milani from 2001 in Italy. And looked, he sprayed oxalic or oxalic and glycerin on glass dishes and dropped live mites in, let them walk for, 24, for um, an hour, then put them on live pupae and then checked for mortality after 24 and 48 hours. <clears throat> Short story that if I'm titrating at 32 micrograms, you would expect to have 100% mortality um, after 48 hours. At that very low micrograms, one-tenth of that, so that three microgram level you, show, you saw, you still expect to have 40% or so mortality if a mite happens to step on that bee. So citric acid, I tried, does not seem to work. And I don't know why. Why would I can have the same acidity with citric acid, same degree of acidity, but I don't get the efficacy against the mite. I don't know why that is. I was hoping I could make citric acid work. Now, apomania, we saw an interesting movie of the heartbeat of the varroa mite. And if you put a large dose, 250 micrograms, that, that's, all, that's about enough to kill a bee, much less a mite. The heart will stop beating after 11 minutes. They can see it slow down. So you, it can have a direct cardiac effect. Some other researchers are taking toothpicks, dipping them into various organic acids, putting them on a slowly rotating device, and then putting a live mite on there and see how long the mite can go around on this device before it drops off dead. So people are doing research. And here's the one I'm curious about. When trachea mite arrived, by fluke, one of the labs found out that if you expose the mite to the smells of vegetable shortening, Crisco, that the young mite questing for a young bee to enter 
could not recognize that young bee by smell. It was an olfactory disruption, and it didn't, it was totally non-toxic, did not kill a single mite, but since the mice could not reproduce efficaciously, the mites would disappear from the hive. I'm wondering if that was happening with oxalic acid, because it reacts clearly with the bee cuticle and appears to release a volatile, because if I have test and control bees treat the bee, one group, the test group, with an acid, and then I take, use sugar to drop live mites from a hive, wash the sugar off them, let them dry, and then put the live mites into a chamber that I've built. So you have a bunch of mites here. At one end, you put your treated bees. At the other end, your control bees. Then we put an uh, air hose to suck air in. So we draw air in from either side. So the air goes over the treated bees or over the control bees. And the mites have the choice of which odor they want to walk to. If they had no preference, the red would be right even with the blue at this line. Clearly, in almost every test, a very strong preference for the untreated bees. They don't like the odor of bees that have been exposed to an acid at anything, any dose. The odd thing is, you put the mites in a petri dish on filter paper and put a drop of the acid there, they just walk over it, don't even know it, notice it. It's not the smell of the acid that bothers them, it's the smell of how it reacts on the bees. So we've still got a lot to learn about the best ways to use these natural uh, treatments. When breeding the um, queens to be varroa resistant, uh -huh. um, you said that um, the worker bees are the ones that change their behavior. So you, do you have hard data to support that putting a um, resistant bred queen in a non-resistant hive changes the behavior of the non-resistant hive? No, 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 I see what you're saying. No, there's no magic wand. The queen does not generally change the, the behavior. It takes a while. That's yeah, why yeah. we have to wait a while to, to see. Yeah, until the genetics the, passed on the is genetics what passed on. the Correctly. behavior is. Okay, yeah, thank you, okay. sorry. Um, have you or anybody identified the actual genes or alleles responsible for resistance? Some people have. I have, that's, I'm st avoiding that intentionally because I'm doing a demonstration project for the commercial queen producers. I'll leave it to other researchers to spend the time with the, um, looking at the genetics. But yes, some genes have been, and that would be called marker-assisted selection, which can be used in a breeding program, but I'm intentionally not doing, using that. Mm -hmm.